And we welcome today uh, uh, to our table, to our voices, introduction to the segmental assessment of trunk control, more commonly known as the SAPCO in educational settings, where we're welcoming Sandra Savidra and Denise uh, Swenson, uh, who are op on opposite coast today. Denise coming to us from Maryland, and Sandra recently retransplanted back to Oregon. Uh, nobody can tell us more about the, yourselves and the SATCO uh, than you can. So I am just going to stop sharing on my end and ask you to start sharing. Uh, Sandra and Denise, Sandy, go ahead and we are here to learn from you. So welcome everybody. I, my name is Sandy Saavedra. I um, am a, I'm, I'm a native Oregonian, but I spend a lot of time on the East Coast as I was learning my research and skills and faculty skills. Um, and now I've returned and I'm excited to share with you um, more information about the segmental assessment of trunk control. Good morning, everybody. I'm Denise Swenson coming to you from Maryland, where it is, I, I think you guys are having some weather, but we have a beautiful day. Um, yeah, I am um, been working with Sandy for a few years, um, kind of uh, implementing the strategies of uh, this SATCO in early intervention and school-based practice. And I'm glad to be here today to share those things with you. Um, I work for a large public school system in uh, Maryland and um, I also recently got an as an adjunct professor to um, South College in Knoxville, Tennessee. So happy to be here. Okay, so let's get on with it. So today's objectives, uh, we're going to provide a brief overview of the segmental assessment of tr trunk control known as the SATCO. Um, we're going to just kind of give you a teaser because we don't want to give you everything as we'll be uh, here, we'll be with you in, in person in April. But today we're going to describe the segmental assessment um, of trunk control for postural control and the benefit for positioning children with severe, moderate to severe disabilities. We're also going to identify some opportunities to apply those principles today so that you can get going, maybe even tomorrow, um, of the SATCO to optimize the positioning for participation in functional and academic tasks. Okay. Before we get started, um, we want to know who you are. Well, who are audiences? What, what, um, what do you do for, um, for your um, practice? And then also how familiar you how familiar are you with the SATCO principles? So if you can answer those two polls, we'd appreciate it. I don't know if we have uh, a result from the poll yet, anybody? We're almost there, okay. but most of our audience, all of our audience are PTs or OTs. Okay. Um, you can go ahead and end that poll and it should share the results on the screen, I believe. Yes, if you end the poll and then click share results, it should show a graph for us. There we go. Wow, everybody answered, isn't that great? <laughs> Can you scroll, oh, I see. Nice. And, yeah, and then how about the, I'm gonna just take a look at the other one. Okay, yeah. Oh, so wonderful, looks like good. We have a lot of people who've heard of it but aren't familiar with it. So a few of you have, have um, had some exposure. Excellent, excellent. All right. So let's get started. I'm and gonna by start exposure, uh, you know, I think that's different levels. Uh, we in 2020 uh, that fall, um, we you put together some um, professional development virtually. Uh, so some of our folks have had uh, several days worth of, of this and it's uh, some uh, updates that you're going to be offering. So for us, uh, for people to have heard it, but it's going to be on, on different levels of exposure. Thrilled to, thrilled to move it forward. 
I'm actually thrilled to see that there are some people that that have never who have never heard heard of it, and they're uh, joining today to learn about it. I'm very excited about that. Me too. too. Yeah. Um, all right. So let's start here. We're going to start a little bit with um, typical development, and so that you can understand a little bit where we're coming from with atypical development a little bit later on. So when you think about typically developing in infants, trunk control progresses, as we know, cephalocardially, starting with the head control and then moving down to incorporate control at the thoracic level, the lumbar, and then sacral and hip musculature. We see this development during the first year of life, and parents instinctively lower their hand placement as their child gains control at each segment. So you know, if you see in the first picture, dad's cradling the baby's head. And then in the second picture, mom's kind of got her hands a little bit supporting that um, occipital area and way up at the upper thoracic and shoulder area. And then as you see the progression and the child gets older, the parents instinctively move their hands down. Many children with neuromuscular impairments have difficulty gaining that head control at all. And then achieving control of the individual segments is even more difficult because of lack of adequate muscle strength, abnormal tone, and atypical patterns of movement. So we're gonna take a look here. And once babies begin to sit up on their own, they instinctively use different strategies to, re to maintain that upright neutral vertical position, such as using a wide base of support with their legs, using their hands to prop sit. And then they experiment moving their center of gravity outside of the base of support and develop protective extension reactions. As the trunk and hip control develops, and refines, they sit with their hands free, free for play, move out of sitting with ease, and finally develop the ability to sit with their arms and feet free while maintaining an upright posture. Sandra, could you click that so that the green? Oh, no, I think. Back. Yeah, that green. Yeah, I did. Okay, great. Thank you. Well, so some children lack even typically developing children lack good control in sitting and use a variety of different strategies to remain upright muscle tone plays a significant role in the development of that strength and postural control you can see these children um, have that kind of low trunk tone if you will used to be called um i don't remember like uh, um, minimal dysfunction or tone control or whatever but if you think about the challenge of working with children with head and trunk deficits is that they never really gain the trunk control needed for hands-free play unless they're doing something else. They either need to prop themselves up using their hands or other means, or they collapse into the supports like the little boy on the left. So how do we assess the lack of trunk control? And what can you do to improve or compensate for those deficits? So we're gonna look at some compensatory strategies here in typically developing children. So if you ask a child to stop using those compensatory strategies, such as um, asking a child who's sitting while propping with both hands to just raise your hands, the child has no choice but to substitute that compensatory strategy with another one. So if you ask someone who's prop sitting to raise their hands, they may do that whole spinal collapse. And sometimes children don't have the muscular endurance to maintain that proper alignment. So if you ask someone to sit up straight, they can do it for a few minutes maybe, and then they don't have that endurance and they collapse again. So we're looking at that trunk alignment, we're looking at hand support. So they'll either put their hands down on the seat, they may put their hands to their mouth, they use their hand um, to their own body, say on their knees, or to another adult, they bring their hands together um, on an object or, or clasp their, their hands together. We look at um, leaning forward, arching backward, a rounded back, collapse beyond the normal curves, and a chin poke or head extension. In the movement strategies, kids sometimes um, apply a stiff and more rigid um, 
trunk or they lack that movement above the level of control. And sometimes they, how about those kids that they can't sit still, they are constantly moving. So they, they are giving that rapid movement to sort of control their, um, their, their trunk uh, musculature on their basis support. So when we look at um, how you assess it, there are a few measures out there that assess trunk control. One of them is the trunk, um, sorry, sorry, the level of sitting scale. The level of sitting scale is included in the seated postural control measure. Um, and it's the, it's the cover sheet as a global index of the child's sitting ability and assesses trunk control as a single unit, measuring if the child can move in different planes and return to upright. So they ask if they can move forward and sit back upright to the left, to the right and backward and then sit upright again. The next one is the trunk control measurement scale and that assesses static and dynamic sitting balance. So in the static section, the child's hands rest on their thighs while they sit upright. So that was one of the compensatory strategies that I already mentioned. Then they raise their arms and then they cross their legs. And again, it's assessing that trunk as a single unit. So it's using the arms and legs, uh, changes in position of the arms and legs to see if they can maintain that upright posture. The GMFM has several items which assess the ability of the child to maintain upright head position when given the support at the thorax. And it's not at a defined level. It's just like support at the thorax and see if the child can uh, keep their head in alignment for 10 seconds. Or then they ask the child to lean forward and touch a toy and then re-erect. They also ask if they can uh, turn to the left or the right to touch a toy 45 degrees be beyond their hip. So again, looking at the whole um, trunk as a single unit. Finally, there's the spinal alignment and range of motion measure. And that protocol begins with the observations of a person's alignment and posture. If it's normal or optimal, that's um, the, the, uh, the child is asked or the person is, is asked to get into your most uh, normal or optimal position. And they give three opportunities to actively correct and assume those positions. In all those measures, the trunk, is, the trunk is seen as a single unit while moving either the arms, the legs, or the trunk in straight planes. So how do we help children move forward if they're stuck using compensatory strategies? And I'll hand this over to Sandy. Okay. So um, to help children move forward, um, we use the segmental assessment of trunk control. This gives us a measure of trunk control that is not a measure of the whole trunk, but allows you to measure different levels of trunk control so that you can assess how much a child has progressed towards the ability to sit independently. All of the other tests require that they sit independently before you can score them. And we need to find a way to help the children who cannot sit get to that point. So in um, Penny Butler, created a, a biomechanical approach to training trunk control in children with cerebral palsy back in the 19, late 1990s. And in order to decide where to put the support when she was training children, she actually created the, SAT, the original SATCO. During my PhD work at University of Oregon, I worked with Penny to refine the SATCO and publish it so that it could be available to clinicians around the world. The SATCO tests children's trunk control as, a, as the evaluator progresses um, from the very highest point where you give support solidly to the whole trunk and you're just assessing, do they have head control? And then you gradually move your hands down the trunk incrementally at specific bony landmarks and assess upper thoracic, mid thoracic, lower thoracic, upper lumbar, lower lumbar, then finally full control. And so there are several principles with the SATCO. One is that you must test them in neutral vertical alignment to really assess if they can control upright position and gravity, you need to keep the base of support vertically aligned for them. The manual support is at very specific segments and we assess three types of control. So we assess whether or not the child has static control, that's the ability to just get aligned in the first place whether they have active control, that's the ability to stay aligned when they become active and turn their head or reach. And finally, reactive control, which is if you give them a perturbation, 
that they can recover and, and keep themselves upright. So the neutral vertical pelvis, if you're, you're, most of you are probably sitting this morning while you listen to this. Um, if you're sitting, do a little bit of a pelvic rock. Can you feel how when you rock backwards, it makes your whole spine collapse? And when you rock forward, how you sit up straighter? So this is important when we're assessing children's trunk control. If we're trying to assess them and they have their pelvis rocked backwards, they cannot give us their full trunk extension. So this goes through just the different levels. Manual support is first at the shoulders to test head control, then the axilla for upper thoracic, then just below the scapula for mid thoracic. Then we put support at the lower ribs for lower thoracic. Your hands go just below the ribs for upper lumbar. You support at the pelvis for lower lumbar, and then you look at the full trunk with no support. So you have seven different levels and static active and reactive control to test prior to getting to the point that the other typical sitting um, assessments begin. It just gives us more refinement and granularity to be able to specify exactly where the precise area is that a child should be working if we want to help them gain control. So the SATCO is done with the child seated on a bench and um, the feet are usually on the floor or a stool. We'll tell you more, there are some times when you don't have the feet supported, but in most cases, the feet are supported on the floor or a stool. Manual support is provided at all those different levels that I just talked about. The child's head is upright, their hands and arms are free of support, and we use a strap system for thigh and pelvic alignment to keep the child well positioned so that the base of support is solidly vertical. At each segment, three aspects of control are assessed. So you give support, everything below the level that you're testing is well supported. And at each level, you repeat the same kind of process. You have, you ask, can the child align and maintain for five seconds? And I often will just count for a child, hold a toy in front of them and, and, and count for five seconds to see, are they able to stay upright and steady? Then you ask them to turn their head or reach for an object. And very often, this is much more challenging for children. They have to have what we refer to as active or anticipatory control to judge ahead of time the mechanical change in their center of mass as they begin to move their body. So active is often harder to achieve than static. And we, the third thing we look at is reactive. And this is where if they're sitting nice and straight and you give them a little nudge, are they able to keep their balance or return quickly to an upright position? There are a number of tester errors and we'll go into these in greater detail um, during the, the TIES conference, but just kind of as an overview, there are three I'm going to talk about right now. One is having visual clarity to be able to see what's happening in the child's body and where your level of support is. The next is um, not having good hand support or, or not, not paying attention to the rigor of how you use your hands. And the third is looking at the trunk alignment below the level that you're supporting. So here's, um, if, if a child has a bulky t-shirt on, it becomes very difficult for you to assess exactly where your hands were placed. It also becomes very difficult to judge the alignment of the trunk underneath that. So there are several solutions that we've come up with for that. One is for little babies, we can just take their shirt off and that's not usually a big problem depending on weather. However, that doesn't work in schools at all. Um, we have had um, older children who would come into the lab wear a tank top um, and we can sometimes have, um, you can ask parents to have the child um, bring a tank top to school or you can just use a snug fitting shirt. So usually when I've done SATCOs within the school setting, I have used the snug fitting shirt routine. And then there's something you may see in the snug fitting shirt routine that makes a big difference. And that is to have the color behind where you have the visual, where you're visualizing the child. You don't want the person who's standing on that side of the child to have the same color shirt as the child, or, or you lose the, the ability to see those contours of where the child's body is. The next tester error is alignment of hands. And this is probably the one that, one of the ones that takes the longest time to practice because it doesn't actually come so intuitively. You want to be sure, because we're checking for very specific levels of control, you want your hands to be 
horizontal. So that they're, you're not supporting multiple segments of the trunk, you're just supporting at one specific segment at each time. So here you can see I'm actually the one who is in error in both of these images where my hands are, I think as therapists, when you put your hands on a child and they start to collapse forward, we automatically do this process of, of raising our, our fingers upwards to help give them a support upwards. That unfortunately offers a different level of support and we're trying to assess what the child has, not what we're offering them. And so you really wanna be specific about giving um, a horizontal support with your hands. And the solutions that often help is be sure that whoever's working with you on the SATCO is helping to watch you because it's easy to have this sneak up. So we often do videos, we recommend video to go back and, and review and see if you were, were, were holding your hands level, but that's too late if you look back at the video. So we try to have someone else in the room who's watching all the time. It's their job to say, make sure your hands are horizontal. And elbows up is surprising, it, it's helpful. I have a tendency to have my elbows down. And when you raise your elbows up, you have a tendency to be able to get your hands flat. So you can see the, the student who was working on the front of this child did a nice job of keeping her hands, her elbows up, and it also helped her to keep her hands a little bit flatter. The third error um, that testers can make is not supporting the trunk vertically below the level that you're testing. So you can see here, we don't actually know what this child will, he's, we've put him in so much of a posterior pelvic tilt and a, and a collapse backwards with his lower trunk that we can't really assess whether he's able to come up vertically um, in the levels that we're assessing. In this case, we got a little overzealous and went too far the other way. So again, this is helping you to realize why we, we really like to have more than one person available for SATCO because when you're the person supporting, you don't always see these angles um, as well. People sometimes will put a mirror over to the side so that they can just, if they're supporting, glance into that mirror and see whether or not they've got the child aligned in a vertical alignment. In addition to tester errors, we look for something called compensatory strategies. And again, I'm just gonna give you a little flavor of these because we'll go into a lot more detail um, during the TIES conference, but to give you an idea of what you're looking for, hand support is a big one. Um, trunk alignment and um, head alignment are the three that I'm going to talk with you about. So a compensatory strategy is what a child does when they do not have enough control to be able to be upright with the level of support that you've given them. So when control becomes challenged, you will start to see these type of, of um, strategies. And when you see these strategies, you want to really double check at that level because if the child has no choice but to give you the strategy, then you have found the level where they do not have control and that they're forced to do comp compensations. If we're trying to improve a child's ability to be upright, we want to be able to give them an opportunity to practice upright. If we put the support too low, the only choice they have is to practice compensation. So it's very important to be able to start to recognize when they're compensating and how to give the right support so that they have the freedom to practice postural control. So let's look at hand support. Hand support happens all the time. These are typical babies who we use when we first um, worked on the SATCO babies will put their hands in their mouth. They'll grab hold of the tester's uh, hand that's supporting them. They'll put a toy and prop it against their head. They do all kinds of things with their hands to automatically give some support to upright position. And we see this in children with cerebral palsy too. This boy was very creative um, as we were moving down. He suddenly got a little more stable and we looked up and he had placed both hands on top of his head to help stabilize his posture. And it's very common for a child to put one hand down. I'm sure you notice when you're working with children with postural deficits, they very often will put one hand down to support themselves. The, the next thing that they will do is a forward or backward trunk lean. And so before you saw what happened when we didn't have them vertical below the level of support, now we have, these are both pictures where we have support a little bit lower, but the lower part that we're supporting is vertical and the children are compensating by leaning forward or leaning backward. And you will see this 
um, very often as you're moving your way down the SACO, all of a sudden you're going to notice that child is suddenly starting to slump forward or starting to arch backwards over your hands. And those are, those are compensatory strategies to help them control being upright, um, but, but they're not able to keep themselves vertical. And the final one is the head forward or a chin poke. So you can see here, this boy is held nicely vertical below the level that we're testing, but his head does not come up into, into um, vertical alignment. He's hanging forward. Um, and when we ask him to raise his arms, you can see that now his head tips backwards. So he's showing us in both cases that he's challenged for keeping himself upright. A lot of children will use this, we call it a chin poke. Um, but when you do that, even for yourself, just take a minute to hold your head straight and then do a little chin poke. Can you feel how that lets you just kind of lay back on your, on your joints and you're not have to, having to actively control your neck? So children do that a lot because it's kind of a, it's a, comp, it's a compensatory strategy for um, challenges in posture. So we're going to pause now just to see if there are any questions about that before we go into some cases of showing you how we apply the SAT code to positioning. So I think I'm going to stop sharing for just a minute so we can see people's faces if they have questions they would like to ask. Good morning, I have a question. I think I wrote down that you said they lose control below where the tester's hands are positioned. It seems like it should be above. It's definitely above. And if I said okay. below, I don't know what I was saying. We want to give solid support below the level right. of testing. Right. So, and yeah, so our hands give support below where our hands are. So if we start to see the loss of the compens compensating strategies come in at the level where our hands on, that's the level we start maybe one up working on. Right. Right. Okay. Thank you. Exactly. Thank you. Yep. Yep. Any other questions about that so far? Hearing none at this point, I'm going to share my screen again and we will continue. And Denise, I think it's your turn. Just trying to find that unmute button. <laughs> Thank you. Um, all right, so we're going to try to give you a little bit of an overview of how these principles then re and then translate into practice. And uh, I'm just going to give you a, just a wee bit of background here. Is that um, years ago, and I, I can't even remember how many years ago now, um, Sandy, we we started working with her and and um, trying to. Um, learn how to do the SATCO as a whole with our uh, physical therapy department or, or staff here in Prince George's County in Maryland. And um, we were in a pilot program and it took us about um, six months uh, through this pilot program. And it was honestly um, really challenging. Um, and now I think the whole process has been refined and streamlined, and it's going to be much easier for you guys. But we were those kind of guinea pigs where we were, you know, trying to figure out how to how to test, uh, look for all compensatory strategies, um, and then how to put all those the results of what we learned into practice. So I want to talk about an aha moment for you. Um, and I'm sure a lot of you have experienced that kind of sweet, miraculous moment when the knowledge that you have and the application of, of that knowledge came together. And then when you, when you, when you something that you learned finally made sense to you and you applied it to a real life situation and you can call it what you will you can call it a eureka moment you can call it an epiphany epiphany or you can call it that aha moment but it's when you get so excited that you're bursting to share it and you just go oh my gosh now i know what i learned and how i can uh, present that and, and and apply those strategies so I had a few of those moments and I'm just gonna share one with you that happened uh, quite a few years ago. Okay, so I had a, a little boy. I, um, well, let me give you a little bit of a, a background. I do all of the 
Part C to Part B assessments. I know one of the things we didn't ask you was how many working in EI and early intervention and how many people are working in school-based. But I'm kind of bridging that gap. I am a dedicated physical therapist that all the children in the county that are turning three um, go through a, a, a team of uh, speech and language uh, educator, OTPT if needed, um, to then assess their skills at that uh, transition of 33, 34 months. And then we move on to writing the IEP for school. So usually I assess about 80 a year as part of that transition process. We see a lot of children with cerebral palsy and Down syndrome. And, and, and um, in addition to the standardized assessment that we um, have to use as a county, I always use the GMFM as a baseline measure for function for kids with say cerebral palsy. So once we finish this six month pilot program with Sandy and Danny Bellows, um, we then had the summer to try and kind of regroup and figure out how we were gonna apply this into practice. So I had an, um, an assessment with a little boy, um, we'll call him Thomas, and he was pretty typical. Um, he was 33 months old. He had a, a typical profile of cerebral palsy, GMFCS level four. Um, with prematurity, seizures, and he was followed by a variety of specialists and, um, and had a variety of medications and things like that. So I, I'm not gonna go through that. But some of the things that, well, that happened during that session was that Thomas seemed to have a lot of strengths, all right? So he, had, he was able to um, uh, crawl, attempts to stand. He um, could prop, uh, he could prop up on his elbows and reach for a toy. He uh, transfers objects from one hand to another and brought his hands together. He imitated vocalizations and gestures with us. Um, he smiled and he took turns and um, he, um, he sort of expressed um, his language with adults. He had good attention to task. So he had a lot of really good challenge, uh, a lot of good um, strengths, but he had some challenges. He had a lot of difficulty playing by himself while sitting in a toddler chair with arms. He needed someone to sit next to him all the time to help him sit up. And they constantly leaned to the right using his left hand for most of his activities. He had adequate head control, but he couldn't achieve and maintain that upright posture for play. So I'm just gonna give you a little bit of a look at, on the next slide, what his, um, what his standardized scores came out to be and what his GMFCS level was. So he fussed and cried during much of the assessment. Um, and so we couldn't give him a more structured test like the Patel Developmental Assessment of Young Children, which are the two, that and the DACI, the, um, the Patel <laughs> is different. The DACI, the Developmental Assessment of Young Children, we have that in our toolbox and we also have the Patel, but because the Patel is so much more structured and standardized and he wouldn't stop crying or fussing, we had to resort to give him the, the DACI too. Uh, just um, a moment, Denise. I know that um, I'm looking and I'm seeing that everybody is muted except for you and Sandy. So I'm believing that some of the noise might be coming from uh, your area. Is that right? It might be. <laughs> okay. Somebody back, and I'm sorry about that. Okay. And, and we understand. <laughs> I just wanted to make sure that everyone knew they should be muted. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Um, we, anyway, these um, were his scores, and I believe we would have scored even lower on more structured testing. Um, I managed to complete the GMFM with him, and his score was just below the 50th percentile in that level four motor growth curve. And then after the assessment was finished and the team and the family met to review his scores, Thomas continued to cry unless someone was sitting right next to him. And we all thought that that was just behavioral. However, of course, being that PT and I wanted to fix things, I remembered that we had a go-to seat in our closet. And so I went and got it so that really we could get through the rest of the, uh, of the assessment and the meeting with the parents. I put it on a toddler chair, I put Thomas into it, and then something very amazing happened. For the next 30 minutes while we went over the assessment with the parents, Thomas played with Lego blocks at a small 
table by himself without crying, without fussing, and he used both hands to stack them and take them apart. So we gave him that trunk control at, the, at that um, mid-thoracic or upper thoracic butt just by this giving him this go-to seat. And, and that was my aha moment. So maybe it wasn't just behavioral, right? Maybe it was about giving him the proper support at the right level at the upper thoracic level, right below the armpits. And I, all of a sudden I realized everything had, we had done in that last six months, I went, oh my goodness, this is what this is all about. Look what happened when we gave this child the right support. And maybe his scores would have been higher because he would have been able to concentrate and really respond because he had all those really good, um, you know, he had all those really good skills, but we couldn't see them because he was challenged so much with his postural control. Anyways, that was my aha moment. And um, I just wanted to share that with you. So now when we look at um, transition, and I, I think about um, how this, the benefit of that segmental approach is, and knowing that, um, for children that are coming from early intervention and going to the preschool, if we can provide that information for the preschool team as we go through that process, it would really um, help with that transition for that child, that family, that teacher, and all the therapists, right? So we want to look at um, now if I can briefly describe that transition process to you and explore the ways to incorporate that using SADCO. And I'm not going to go through like the whole transition process per se. I just want you to understand that the research shows uh, and the laws, what the law states about successful transition. And in the research, it's about engagement, adaptation, and growth and development. And that engagement is defined as the child's ability to interact appropriately with adults, with the materials and with peers in the new environment, given the age and the ability of the child and surroundings. And adaptation discusses the child's relationship to the structure and the culture of the new environment, which is contingent upon engagement, right? And then that continued growth and development in the new, env in the new environment is dependent on both engagement and adaptation. And it's understanding that these measurable outcomes can help families how the experiences that they provide will impact their achievement in preschool. So if we give, I'm thinking, you know, I thought to myself, here's another aha moment, that if we provide those SATCO strategies in early intervention and really gain the parents buy-in, then when they go to preschool and we already have those um, strategies in place, it's so much easier for a successful transition. Um, so, uh, the research, the word in the law in IDEA describes a smooth transition, but that doesn't exactly define what it is. It most likely refers to the transition without a break or a minimal break in service provisions, but the research describes a successful transition, which I kind of just went over on the previous slide, but it comes from an ecological perspective and it's tailored to the needs of the child and it promotes those positive outcomes by increasing skills. Well, if the child can't sit upright and engage, how can we possibly have a successful transition? The bottom line here is that, that, a successful, that a successful transition is also in a critical window of time. And it's usually between four and 12 weeks, depending on how intense the program is, whether a child goes one day or four days or five days. Um, but just so that you know, that critical window of time when a child enters a new environment is really um, influenced by the skills and communication, engagement, and behavior. And one of the things I always like to tell parents is during this transition, children are really, it doesn't matter if they count, if they know their colors, if they um, can write or whatever, it's really about the social engagement. So what better way to do that than being able to get a child eye level with their peers in a good position for them to use their hands for play. So I'm going to hand this over to um, to Sandy now because that research into practice piece I kind of already described about how critical it is to be to do this in early intervention so that then they can be more successful in um, in school-based practice. All right so once we have this information 
How can we use the SATCO information in clinical practice? Can we make a difference in the child's function within the context of their participation in regular family routines and in school routines? Oops, my, there we go. When working with um, families in early intervention, it, we can help them to realize the importance of good postural control for their child's engagement in everyday activities and routines, such as eating, playing, um, and, and interacting with objects. By coaching parents or caregivers to use materials that are found in the home, we can help provide them with segmental support to improve their child's postural control which allows them to more actively participate in family routines and activities. So you can see in this case, you can see things are wrapped around this child to try and support um, her posture a little bit higher up, um, um, just under the axilla. I'm gonna give you an example of a research project that I conducted. I had my students at University of Hartford we went into the public schools and um, we had a few children also who were in EI. And I took my team in who were trained in SATCO and we evaluated the children's positioning devices and made modifications for segmental support. And then some education students um, did behavior coding to see how engaged the children were um, and, and what kinds of um, activities they could do with segmental support versus without. So I'm gonna give you, this is one of the examples. This is a two-year-old. He had quadriplegic cerebral palsy, GMFCS5. And he was just in this stage where he was getting ready to transition from um, EI into a preschool setting. So this is, you can see this video shows him in his usual um, device. And um, his therapist said he has a little bit of head control, she said, because he can occasionally come upright. But what you see here is he really vertically aligned? Um, does it look like he has firm support all the way up to give him what he needs? There you see what she was talking about, that he can come up. Notice how much he had to push with his hand when he came up. So what my team did was they said, well, when we did the SATCO, he had only head control and they were concerned about um, the level of support maybe not being adequate to support him in his function. The education students who did the video um, behavior coding um, gave us this output. So in a 12 minute period of time, we, we filmed for 12 minutes, um, the yellow bands, so you, each row, is just going across time. So you've got about three or four minutes with each band. And you can see that his eye gaze, he was actually quite good at trying to engage with people in the room um, was what he engaged with more than the toy, but he was visually engaging. But the red marks that you see were his attempts to reach. And across a 12 minute period of time, he made only four brief attempts to reach towards the toy. This is how my students set him up. They created a solid vertical support behind his head, solid support to the axilla, and they raised the tray height a little bit so it's up closer to his axilla. And now you can see with that um, solid piece behind his head, he's able to actively raise his head and get it into vertical alignment. And now he's beginning to be able to attempt to reach and interact with the toy. So if I ask you this, the, the questions about segmental principles, is he in neutral vertical alignment? Yes. Does he have firm support at the SATCO level? Yes. Does he have adequate support for function? Yes. Is the child practicing posture? Yes. Now, instead of just hanging his head while he tries to reach or occasionally popping up and falling down again, he is actively holding his head upright through all the time. So he's, he's using that support behind his head. At first, when I saw this concept of giving them a support behind their head, I thought, oh, we're gonna increase extension, extension tone or something, but it really doesn't. It's kind of surprising. I take yoga and when I was learning to stand on my head, the instructor put me against a wall so that I could figure out where up was. And I think a lot of these children who do not have head control have not had the opportunity to figure out where up is. So if, if we were just propping him vertically, he wouldn't be gaining any new motor skills.
But we, in this case, he's actively having to activate his muscles to stay up there. So he can gain some postural control that way. And now you can see that when the, the student's behavior coded this, he continues to have eye gaze for almost the entire time. His eye gaze was constantly involved. And do you see how many more um, attempts he made at reaching and how much longer he worked on getting that arm to come forward where he wanted it? Here he is six weeks later. You can see the students have now added little lateral pads on either side of his head because his mother reported that um, when he had been in this for an extended period of time, he was starting to have his head kind of drop to the side and get stuck. And so they put just a little bit of pad there so that he doesn't fall over. He can still correct as you saw him just do where he pulls his head back to midline. And now the really fun thing is he's attempting to talk to his mother in addition to looking up at her to get her input on the toy. So he's starting to try not only eye and hand coordination, but he's also trying communication while he's upright, which he couldn't do before. So now we look again at the eye gaze and reach and you see he's continuing to have very good eye gaze and lots of opportunities for reach. And Denise, I think I hand this back to you for an example in the schools next. Nope, I guess I, I go through problem solving first. So when you're thinking about positioning and positioning adaptations, you begin by assessing where is the SATCO level. You then provide support at the SATCO level and see how the child functions with support at that level. And very often in the school setting, we will inch up just a little bit on that. So we may position a little bit above the SATCO level because it allows the child to coordinate their posture control and learning new tasks. So it gives them enough support that they can practice posture with the task. Um, and so you, you just keep observing and using your clinical reasoning skills, um, and then you wait for your aha moment. Sometimes you don't have to wait that long. For those of you, you know, you, you're not going to probably feel comfortable following this brief presentation saying, I can do SACCO. But what you can do today is put your hands on kids, get them vertically aligned, and just start asking yourself, does it change their ability to use both hands? Does it change their ability to actively hold their head upright while they're interacting with things? Um, so vertical alignment and support incrementally higher until you see where is that child really at in terms of what level of support they need. Okay, I'm just going to give you a little bit of a teaser for school-based practice um, right now, but um, the SATCO principles are well aligned and well adapted to school-based practice. When you can use a variety of equipment and position changes and put to put children in that um, vertical upright with support at the correct trunk segment, children may be more available for learning. Um, and participation in classroom activities and their social interactions with peers, which I said was one of the really big um, hallmarks of uh, success in preschool. Um, they're more with a more upright posture, improvement in visual skills uh, and, and engagement and eye-hand coordination and oral motor skills are possible. Um, and children may be more likely to participate in classroom routines if they are active participants. So if you give them the right support, um, you know, you'll see a lot of different um, skills and areas coming out. I, and I remember there was a, one child that I had put in a, um, a mobile stander and uh, to go to a reading corner. And I just said, let's put her in here and see if you can, she can be standing in, in that reading corner with the, the reading teacher. And the reading teacher came to me and she said, you know, she said, that child started vocalizing for the first time ever while she was in that stander and was had um, good visual engagement in the story. So that was another kind of aha moment. All right, so why is all of this important in school-based practice? Why is it important um, to get children in that vertical upright position because it's about providing the right supports for participation. The bottom line is participation. It's no good if a child is sitting somewhere off to the side in a beanbag chair or a tumble forms feeding seat uh, or they're, um, they're in their wheelchair with a tray and it's reclined, right, so that their head is supported supposedly staying in an upright position, but their eye gaze is at the ceiling. 
So um, how does that really make them active participants in that preschool? This little guy is Jake. And again, I should say, I'm just gonna give you a teaser about him. He had a little, a very good story. He's in that Meerkat, Meerkat stander there on the right. And we really got him to um, engage and participate in his preschool setting. The OTs work together with the PTs for this. And I will have videos probably in the next session when we um, come out in person. But um, not only the physical supports to the classroom teacher and age and PE teacher, music teacher and art teacher, all the stakeholders who work with the child need to be engaged and, and really um, a, a buy-in in order for this to be successful. So when you, you know, it's one thing to be in early intervention and you've got just the family that you're dealing with, but in school, think of all the people that this child is going to be engaging with and we want buy-in from every, everyone. It's not easy, it's definitely not easy, but if you can show them how by positioning a child using the SATCO principles, you get more engagement, more participation, more visu visual regard, um, more even, um, uh, communication, then then it's better for them, and you, you may have more buy-in. Okay, so the SATCO principles can also be adapted for transition to adulthood, and by using a variety of equipment to position students in vertical upright with support at the correct trunk segment, adolescents may be more available for learning and for participation in employment opportunities and social interactions in the community. With a more upright posture, you have improved visual skills, you can have improved eye-hand coordination, you definitely get improved social interaction, and that can help adolescents really participate in self-advocacy and community activities. So if a position is not ideal, it can work against a child's attempt at postural control. This child was 19 years old when my team went in to see him in the schools, and um, he had, um, on the SATCO, he lost control at the level of his head. And what we noticed was that when he made an attempt to raise his head, he used a whole body attempt. He, he extended his head and his trunk and his legs, everything. He worked so hard to try to get his head upright. And that resulted in him often having kind of an extensor thrust activity. So that caused him to decide to recline his wheelchair and he was reclined in the stander um, to kind of accommodate for all of that, that movement that he tended to do. Um, unfortunately, this doesn't allow him much interaction with the classroom because as he did that extension, he also had with that a left head turn. So he was either actively extending and ending up with a head turn, or if he relaxed, that was the position he ended up in was with that head turned and down to the left. So the teacher really felt like it was hard to get him to get engaged in the class, even though they, they felt that he had more, more that could happen for him. So we'll give more a little more detail, um, but what you can see here is what happened when the students made adjustments. So what they did was that they, we realized that if we gave support to his arms and got him in absolute vertical with something solid behind his head, he was able to come right upright and then he was able to turn his head and look around the classroom. And the, his therapist was really shocked. He said he had never seen him go without doing that extension pattern in his wheelchair. But when this support was put behind his, um, his back and the tray was raised up, he said he didn't see him use that pattern at all. And I think what happened is that we gave him adequate supports for him to be able to raise his head without having to work so hard. All of that extraneous movement was effort for him to try to raise his head when he didn't have adequate support. So this dramatically changed things for him in the classroom. The teacher said he could turn and look and, and interact with other students. Um, you can see he has a great smile and is very social. Um, she said she could then see that he was interested in the material clear across the room because he would turn his head and look at her and watch what she was doing. So it made a big difference for him. So even some of those kids who you may have given up on, it's actually really worthwhile to go back and take a look at what is their SATCO level and how can we position them in a way to see what their best optimal performance might be. 
there are tons of different equipment options um, for for dealing with this. So, you know, I, Denise showed you this meerkat. The meerkat was actually specifically made to offer segmental support. Um, the the Lecky um, go to seat we we've, we've been successful in using a number of times. Although you sometimes have to give a little more pelvic stability and you have to try to get it a little more vertical, um, but those work also quite well. Um, rift and standards, if you get them all the way vertical and raise the tray right, can be great for training head control. But most people use those those leaning backwards. So um, um, Denise was mentioning that at um, Prince George County Public Schools they do a lot with the um, the oh Denise, what are these called? The the wheeled standards. I'm blanking on the name. Uh, dynamic standard. The dynamic. It's a, it's a rift and dynamic standard. Yeah. Yeah. So there's a lot of different options there. And that is time for more questions. I'm not going to stop screen sharing for just a minute, right? But I'm gonna tease you a little bit. I'm gonna show you one more screen here and then we'll take questions from it. Um, if you want more information, we do, we will be at TIES um, for two days, which is, a hands-on course, which is direct contact, um, which is kind of fun. We're just finally coming out of COVID and getting back to doing in-person kind of classes. There are a couple of um, virtual courses um, that can introduce SATCO. Apply EBP has um, several, has some courses on SATCO and positioning and neuro recovery learning has a very in-depth SATCO course um, that um, they are giving a discount mm -hmm. on for people who uh, attend TIES or for people who attend some of the other um, conferences. There's also a um, QR code here. And what this is, is I sent this out to therapists in the state of Oregon who took the SATCO course two years ago that Denise and I offered. And I would like to make it accessible to you who've taken this ECHO TIES course to just give us some feedback about what your needs around SATCO might be so that when Denise and I show up at TIES, we actually hear from the real people out yeah. there what it is that would be most beneficial to you. So if everyone's okay, I'll stop screen sharing and we can do question and answer. And so as part of our discussion, and I saw that you were unmuted, Joanne, so we'll go to you, but I just wanna make sure that you know that part of what we're hoping to do is create a community of practice uh, where you can uh, talk to each other and share ideas. And we can do that through our town halls. Uh, we can have focus group discussions. Uh, we, are, uh, we have had uh, Sandra here as part of um, our feeding conference and really talking about uh, positioning and relationship to feeding. And uh, we are also talking about, depending on the needs, having uh, Sandy and Denise to uh, do a bit of a road show around the state and uh, looking at uh, the kits and, and uh, things that you may need uh, as far as equipment. So we know that you, it, uh, there are lots of ways to talk to each other. So just think about that and give those responses in the survey. So uh, it's an ongoing conversation. And Joanne, I welcome you with your questions and comments. I don't want to monopolize. So I'm going to list the five things and let you pick the one that you want to address so other people have a chance to ask questions. Um, I won't be at the Echo Ties conference because there's no way I can take days off of working with early intervention and ECSE uh, birth through five children that I support in their families. So uh, here's my five points. Um, two persons in any setting is difficult because, yeah, I can have a, an adult, a family member, and me, but it takes a skilled eye. So I'm wondering what second person you use in the school setting. Number two, there seems to be a gap with me between the BDI3 and the DACI. So when you said Thomas would be more, would likely score lower in the BDI, I find that opposite often. They actually score lower in day C because BDI has huge areas, huge gaps that skews the score, in my opinion. But I don't know enough about each tool. Um, with Thomas at GMFC level four, I was surprised that he didn't already have uh, adaptive seating or a personal wheelchair of his own for, for supports. Um, and then let's see. 
just kind of wondered what your personal opinion was for using a Hensinger head support if a child fatigues and doesn't have all of the other accessories easily available. What's your opinion of occasionally tilt in space, which is different than recline, which I think tilt in space would keep the base of level, uh, base of support vertically aligned. And that's it, whichever one you want to address. <laughs> Um, all excellent, excellent okay. questions. I, mean, <laughs> I want to address them all, and I could do some briefly. Um, and I, I'm sorry that you won't be at um, the, the AT Ties conference because um, talking about these two persons in any setting, right? So we actually developed a community of practice within our staff, and I was going to share that during the uh, the conference um, of how we kind of set up a, a calendar, uh, and we had uh, going to the different early childhood centers. Um, with a sort of, I, I don't want to use the word blitz, but we would have clinic days where um, several of us would gather together and um, do the SATCO testing on a number of children throughout the day or AM or PM. Um, also, we have a calendar that we set up so that um, I'm available to go out to a home with an, as, as the transition specialist, I can free up some time to go out to a home with another therapist to do the testing. So there's a number of ways that we do it. Um, and it's, obviously it's not gonna work for every um, jurisdiction, but I was gonna share, I will share um, those strategies that we've developed here and maybe um, other people can modify them. Um, okay, you're the DAC and the BDI. If you think about the DACI is really an ecological test. You're really not supposed to ask the parent questions. And if you do ask the parent questions, they need to be uh, open-ended, not yes, no questions. And I've learned, learned this over time. If you say to a parent, does your child go up and down stairs? And they say, yes, they could mean that they crawl on their hands and knees or and bump down on their bottom. But if you ask them, how does your, describe to me, how does your child do this? That's a different story. But when you're doing the DACI, it really is supposed to be an ecological observational tool that you're seeing what the child is doing in their, um, uh, in their natural environment, and that could be in your contrived school classroom or at home, right? And you're seeing those things. And if there's holes, then you would ask or you uh, uh, ask them to perform something or ask a parent. The BDI is so strict. You get two trials to do um, go up and down stairs. You place the child at the bottom of the stairs. You say, try to go up. And if they get down on their hands and knees to go up the stairs, you place them back at the bottom of the stairs. If they try it again, they're done. They get a zero. So when you're thinking about, and I'm just using that as an example um, between the two of them, but it's so much more um, uh, limited, I think, in if because of the strictness of the test. And those that's the difference between the two. Um, okay, so Thomas, I have a, a adaptive seating. He didn't bring it with him. And I don't remember if he had a wheelchair, but a lot of kids that come up for transition don't have the equipment that they need. Yes, thank you. Put your, <laughs> and that's on, um, that could be a variety of things. And I've done that in the past um, with our, my transition uh, presentation that I did for APTAC um, uh, a couple of years ago. Um, but there's a lot of different reasons why kids come to transition and they don't have the equipment. And I'm not gonna get into all those reasons because I wanna let Sandy um, uh, talk about Hensinger support and tilt in space. <laughs> all right, so with respect to Hensinger, I've never seen it improve a child's upright control. So they tend to just collapse onto it and, and actually practice having their head to the side um, more than anything else. The thing that I found most helpful is if you actually get the support high enough so that you're actually putting maybe the, the tray height clear up under their arms or get something solid and vertical behind their head. Um, even with the little head flaps, it can allow a child to actively be upright. We do sometimes tilt children back slightly while they're training head control. Um, but that's like five degrees, not 
20 degrees. At 20 degrees, you're, you're, you know, I have some slides that I'll show at the conference, but when you look at your visual range and what you can see, you miss a lot um, when you're tilted back. Clearly, children need to have those tilt and space chairs for reasons other than postural control. So, you know, they, they need to sometimes have a break um, in, in how much time they spend upright. But you want to be sure that, you know, we only can get better at what we practice. And I think my biggest concern is that children who have deficits in trunk control may spend their entire day without a single opportunity to practice trying to be upright. And that when they have that opportunity, they don't have enough support to actually be successful at trying to be upright. And so what they do is just practice compensatory strategies. So like the little boy you saw in with the, um, with the um, in his initial stander, how his head was hanging sideways 90% of the time during that trial. If you can't practice being upright and staying upright, you can't gain that skill. And, and so that's my concern with some of the kids who are wearing Hensinger collars and are in tilt and space chairs all the time. They tend to be left in tilt and space chairs because when you bring them upright, there aren't adequate supports um, in the whole trunk to be able to, to have them be able to actively raise their head and be successful. Um, and so their head falls forward. And so people tilt them back and they spend their day not ever practicing what you would like to give them the opportunity to learn. That was kind of a long way around the question. Denise, do you have anything to add to that? No, I think we covered it with one minute to spare. <laughs> and I feel bad if there's any other questions out there in the audience. Don't feel bad because Joanne, it sounds like she had uh, writ things written down and that's the organized person that she is. And we appreciate that. Certainly, if there are other questions, um, I don't know about you, but I can stay on an extra moment for that. So um, if anyone does have a question, feel free to throw it out there. And it sounds to me like Joanne did a great job of helping with topics to fill the rest of the time. Uh, Joanne, thank you for that. <laughs> yeah, and Joanne, I, the one other thing I want to add about the DC and the BDI, I mean, we have to do it as part of the uh, Maryland State Department of Education. Um, we have to do a standardized test for children. Um, I certainly don't have to do a, a BDI or a DC on a child such as Thomas, right, to know that he's going to be eligible for services after three um, because we know he's not walking so we know that his gross motor skills are at a deficit the one thing i will say about those two tests while i have to do it i don't like it especially for children with cerebral palsy because it doesn't tell you anything about function and again function of participation are those things that we want to and we really want to encourage as kids transition to um, preschool setting and I, while it's we use it you know to see what their age equivalent is or what their standard score is, it doesn't tell me a lot about function. Well, and I'm I'm in early intervention primarily. I do some preschool, but um, and with our standard for eligibility, they they have to score either two D standard deviations or more in one area, or one point five in two areas. And often because of that 1.5 in two areas, if the only area is gross motor, I will put myself on the eval team and use my professional judgment to say, let's qualify them for early intervention anyway, even though they only scored 1.5. And I just, depending on the age range of the child where that Battelle is, like it seemed like there were real gaps in the seven-year-old range. They weren't 